Thank you, Eric. I appreciate that. You know, studying Bible prophecy for some 33 years now, going to Israel some 27 times, you know, <clears throat> I, I think I've seen it all, <laughs> really. And I think it's, it's not getting any better. It's, it's, it's only getting worse. You know, the abuse, the misuse of a subject that permeates at least, at least one-fourth of Scripture. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of Scripture, Brother Tom. You know that. That's a lot of prophecy there. But yet today in the church, it's being misused and abused. We here at Today in Bible Prophecy Ministries would never, ever engage in such nonsense. I preach at churches all across the United States. I teach tour groups in Israel. I do a live stream Wednesday through Friday on my Facebook page. And I, I'm repetitious when I say this. I say it over and over and over, the same things over again, because I want to instill it in your minds. If you're going to study Bible prophecy, you need to study it for its plain sense interpretation. Because if the plain sense makes sense, don't look for any other sense, or you will end up with nonsense. And when it comes to Bible prophecy today, I'll tell you folks, there is so much nonsense out there today, especially if you go on YouTube, and yes, even Christian TV. There is so much nonsense and abuse and misuse of Bible prophecy. We will never ever do that. I think I, I made my point during Sunday school. All I did was present the plain sense interpretation of Scripture as we looked at Daniel chapter 7 concerning the, the, the four beasts that Daniel saw and then Revelation chapter 13 and verse number 2. Now, I look at the political. Okay, I, I look at the news every single day because I want to stay abreast as to what is going on. I look at the political because the political is set in the stage for the prophetic to be fulfilled. Now, I believe we're drawing ever so close, brother, to that next main event we call the rapture of the church. Christmas time reminds me not only of the first coming of Jesus Christ as a babe laid in a manger. The Bible doesn't say born in a manger. Laid in a manger. At his first coming, he was a lamb led to the slaughter. At his first coming, he allowed man to put their filthy hands on him. But at his second coming, he ain't coming back as a lamb. He's coming back as a lion of the tribe of Judah. That's Revelation chapter 5 and verse number 5. That's why I want to talk about this morning the tower of the flock, known in Hebrew as Migdal Adar. We always talk about Bethlehem, right? Now, I love going, taking my tour groups to Bethlehem. But we seem to forget that when we back up from Micah 5.2 to Micah chapter 4, verse 8, Micah talked about another town that nobody really mentions anymore or doesn't mention it at all for that matter. So I want you to take your Bibles and go with me to Micah chapter 4, though. Chapter 4 and verse number 8 as we talk about this place called in Hebrew Migdal Adar. What happened at Migdal Adar 2,000 years? years ago. Well, Micah, chapter 4, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Jonah, Micah, okay, if you want to try to find it that way, Micah, chapter number 4, it's right after the book of Jonah, Micah chapter 4, and we're going to look at verse number 8. Notice what the Jewish prophet is talking about here in Micah, chapter 4, and verse Number eight, and I'm going to go ahead and read just one verse right here. And thou, you might want to circle this with your pen or highlight it, whatever you have. O tower of the flock. Well, the, in Hebrew, that's Megdal Adar. O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion. Unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion. The kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Let's pray this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, once again, thank you for allowing me to stand behind this sacred desk, Lord, to open your precious word. 
to look at the events that unfolded 2,000 years ago as the Jewish prophet Micah not only revealed to a special priestly sect at Migdal Adar, the tower of the flock, about the first coming, the first dominion of Israel's Messiah. But it also talks about where he would be born. And so, Father, I pray that as we look at this passage, as we study your word, may your Holy Spirit this morning, Lord, have his will and his way. Lord, be in Christmas, people exchanging gifts. We know, Lord, the greatest gift of all to humanity today is the gift of eternal life, paid for by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus on Calvary's cross 2,000 years ago. And Father, if there is someone here this morning and they don't have that assurance of going to heaven when they die, I pray that today would be the day of salvation because tomorrow just might be too late. May they call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. So, Father, may you now be glorified in everything that is said and done here this morning. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Oh, let me get my little, where's the little clicker here? Here we go. All right. The tower of the flock mentioned here in Micah chapter 4 and verse number 8. Migdal Adar in Hebrew. It was there some 2,000 years ago that there was a priestly sect known as Levitical shepherds. Or you can call them priestly shepherds. And what they did is that they were tasked with the high priest in Jerusalem to oversee the lambs that were being born at the tower of the flock 2,000 years ago to make sure that nothing happened to these lambs, to make sure that they were born without spot and without blemish. Amen? Because in Leviticus chapter 1, verse 3, God said, when you sacrifice a lamb, it is to be without spot, amen, without blemish. Why? God wants a perfect sacrifice. And we know that Jesus is the Lamb of God who what? Taketh away the sin of the world. He is God's spotless Lamb. But at Migdal Adar, the tower of the flock 2,000 years ago, these priestly shepherds had the responsibility from the high priest in Jerusalem, the Kohen Hagadol, to make sure nothing happened to those lambs. They had the task, the responsibility of protecting those lambs. So they were in that tower, which was roughly about three stories high. And they had a bird's eye view of that flock. So if a lamb was born, they immediately had to take that lamb and wrap that lamb in swaddling clothes or in temple cloths to make sure that nothing happened to the lamb and that the limbs would grow straight. Now, why would the priests do that? Why did they have the task at Migdal Adar of watching over those lambs or sheep? Because they were brought to the temple in Jerusalem for what? Absolutely. They were brought to the temple in Jerusalem for sacrifice. And that's exactly, they were, they were brought from Migdal Adar, which is near Bethlehem, by the way. They were brought from Migdal Adar, the tower of the flock, five miles north, not that long, five miles north to Jerusalem, to the temple where these lambs would be sacrificed. And before they got there, they had to have been inspected and examined to make sure that there was no spot, no broken skin, no nothing before those lambs were sacrificed at the temple in Jerusalem. The tower of the flock, Migdal Adar, as I said, is uh, located right, it's adjacent to the modern city of Bethlehem today. Now, what you're looking at over here is the church of the nativity in Bethlehem. Mind you, Jesus was not born in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. <laughs> right. 
He was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Jesus is a Jew. Wasn't a Pentecostal. Wasn't even a Baptist. He was a Jew. And the only denomination he knew 2,000 years ago is he was of the tribe of Judah. Why do we call Jews Jews today? A Jew is someone from Judea. Bethlehem, Judea. By the way, a king was born there 3,000 years ago. In Hebrew, they call him Melech David. King David was born in Bethlehem, the city of David. You're looking at the city of David. Remember Luke 2.11? Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is who? Christ the Lord, the Messiah of Israel, the Savior of the world. So I can't use my laser on the TV screen, but we go into this area right here. You have to duck into that little hole right there, that little hole in the wall, in order to go into the church of the nativity because they believe that it was in that area the Lord Jesus was born. But I don't like taking my tour groups into this shrine. It's a 1,500-year-old church. What I do is when I take my tour groups to Bethlehem, I take them underground where there are a series of 2,000-year-old caves that used to be Jewish homes back in the day, 2,000 years ago, for those who couldn't afford the more luxury homes, if you will, because there really wasn't a whole lot of room in the inn. So they went underground and had these 2,000-year-old homes where we see the remains of these little feeding troughs where the animals would eat out of, where they would put the water, where they would put the food where they would lay a newborn Jewish infant. I'm going to show you what that feeding trough looks like. But what you're looking at right here is the modern city of Bethlehem. And you know what they're saying right now? We're hurting today. You know why we're hurting in Bethlehem today? There's no tourists. Israel once again shut the country down. They depend on thousands and thousands of dollars in tourism, it's not happening because now we've got this, this variant, this Omicron, whatever they want to call it. So they once again shut the borders down. And what I've just learned, probably by Monday, Israel is going to declare the United States of America a red country because all these cases are rising again. So that is what Bethlehem looks like. Adjacent to here would be Migdal Adar, where the Tower of the flock would have been. So let me go to the next one over here. I know it seems like we have a little bit of a delay there. I'm not sure what's going on with the, here we go there. So again, it was these priestly shepherds that made sure that these lambs that were born, they were not attacked by wild animals, or they would not penetrate uh, the flock, and these priests had to make sure no harm came to those lambs. They were responsible to protect that flock at all costs. Amen? They were Levitical shepherds. They were priestly shepherds. And they had been chosen and trained by the high priest in Jerusalem to oversee those flocks there near Bethlehem. And I got to tell you, these guys were like extraordinary shepherds. They required special training and special treatment to observe those lambs that were born right there at the tower of the flock in Micah chapter 4 and verse number 8. And again, in ancient times, a watchtower was used by the shepherds to protect these flocks from the beast and enemies and so on and so forth. But as I said, when a lamb was born, those priestly shepherds would be looking down from that three-story tower. And when they saw a lamb born, they sprung into action. What did they do? They saw a lamb born. They would gently pick up that lamb. They would lay it down. They would take the special temple cloth, swaddling clothes, if you will, and they would wrap that lamb up, making sure that everything was straight. They would examine the lambs to make sure there was no spot, no blemish, or anything for that matter. And then when the lamb calmed down, they would bring it back to the mother for nursing. Now, you know, in first century Israel, sheep herding was a hereditary occupation, Amen. And generations and generations of shepherds were trained to care for these special. What was David's occupation, by the way? 
Yeah, exactly. He was a shepherd boy who became a king, amen? Israel's second king for that matter. And when that lamb was born, it was taken by the shepherds, examined, wrapped in those swaddling clothes, and they made sure that that lamb was wrapped tightly, making sure everything grew straight. You know, it's like they, I don't know if they had magnifying glasses 2,000 years ago, but man, they were trained to make sure there were no scabs on the body, no broken skin, nothing. The lamb had to be perfect. And if it passed the test, it will be delivered to Jerusalem, to the temple for the high priest to sacrifice on the high holy days like Passover and, and the Day of Atonement and things of that sort. But it was wrapped tight in swaddling cloth, designated temple cloths for that matter, to make sure everything would grow properly. And then that lamb would be laid in a manger. Actually, folks, what you're looking at right now is a 2,000-year-old manger. It's a stone feeding trough. And when I take my tour groups underground, we're looking over at the shepherd's fields. I take my tour groups underground. These things are everywhere. I'm like, Patty, look, there's a manger right there. Look, there's another one over there. Look, there's another one. They went there everywhere. Some of them in great condition. Some of them snapped in half. But they're 2,000 years old. That's where they would have fed the animals. They would have put the food, the grain, the water in there. But if an infant was born, that infant would be laid in that very manger. It was something like this where our Lord was placed in 2,000 years ago. You know, here in the West, we like to Gentilize everything. So, <laughs> not trying to be mean or nothing like that, but, you know, we, you know, we, we say, well, maybe something like that right there. Well, there's nothing wrong with, wrong with that. But, you know, we, we see this wooden manger with, you know, the two, you no know, leg things crossed. That's, that's not what we're talking about here, folks. This is what we're talking about right here. You got to put it in a Jewish context, amen? Because the, Christianity has its Jewish roots. And if we divorce ourselves from our Jewish roots, we're, not, we're only getting half the picture here. So we need to dismiss all this, this Gentile. You know, people today were like, oh, we shouldn't have a Christmas tree. That violates Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah doesn't talk about a Christmas tree. He didn't even know what a Christmas tree was some 2,700 years ago, amen? We just get so legalistic today. That it really makes me sick, to be honest with you, amen? We just need to, stay, we need to stay biblical here. But that's what it looked like right there. Our Lord would be laid in something like that 2,000 years ago, wrapped in tight, swaddling specially designated temple cloths, and then that lamb would be laid in a manger to keep them contained while they were being examined for skin blemishes. And once it was, examination was complete, it was given back to the mother for nursing in order for it to calm down. But do you know, Migdal Ada not only is mentioned in uh, Micah chapter 4 and verse number 8, but it is also mentioned going back to the book of Genesis, chapter 35 and verse 21. It says, and Israel, by the way, it's talking about Jacob, right? Jacob's name was changed from Jacob to Israel, Genesis 32, 28. And Israel journeyed and spread its tent beyond where? It mentions tower and then Ader, <laughs> Migdal Ader, the tower of the flock. Micah chapter 4 and verse number 8. Jacob, Rachel, his family are on their way toward Bethlehem. All of a sudden, Rachel dies. She dies on her way to Bethlehem. Dies right in the area of Migdal Ader. Dies in the area where the tower of the flock would have been. And she's buried right in that very area of Migdal Adar, and this, this is the reason why today, when you go toward Bethlehem, you're going to go past this structure right here. Remember, you read Hebrew right to left. Chaver Rachel, tomb of Rachel, right near Bethlehem. And you got thousands and thousands of Jews that go and pay their respects to Rachel because she died right near Bethlehem. She died right near the tower of the flock. She died right near Migdal Adon. That's where the traditional tomb of Rachel is 
today. Just as the lambs were wrapped tightly in those temple cloths, those swaddling clothes, if you will, to make sure the limbs and everything would grow straight, and then they would place that lamb there in the manger for examination. The same thing was done with babies. Exactly what they did 2,000 years ago. When a Jewish infant was born, they would immediately take that Jewish baby and wrap that Jewish baby in swaddling clothes. Lay that baby there in a manger, not a wooden manger that we see. That right there, that's a perfectly preserved stone manger right there. And really, when you think of a manger, what you're really thinking of is a animal feeding trough. That's all they were. Animal feeding troughs to feed or water their animals, but the babies were laid in there. And that's exactly where our Lord was laid 2,000 years ago, around 4 B.C. So Jewish infants required the same care at birth. Can we go to Luke chapter 2, please? Let's look, let's look at Luke chapter 2. Dr. Luke. Luke chapter 2. And notice with me, if you will, please, Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter number 2. Notice with me, please, in verse number 7. Luke chapter 2 and verse number 7. It says this, And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him, what? To make sure that the bones and the limbs would grow properly, make sure they grow straight to wrap him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a, we can say a feeding trough as well, a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. My, my uh, tour guide, my Israeli tour guide, Hillel Bar today said, August, we are right now underground in all these caves that you're looking at right here were ancient Jewish homes 2,000 years ago. And when a baby was born, they laid him in something like that right there, pointing out one of the mangers to us. It was, uh, I, I said, do you think that maybe... Joseph and Miriam, Joseph and Mary, and the family could have lived somewhere in this area. He said, August, it's a very strong possibility. I can't be for sure what cave it was, but it's a very strong possibility. We don't know exactly what manger or what cave it was, but this is where poor Jewish families lived 2,000 years ago. That's why you got to go to Israel, man. Put it all in perspective, amen? I mean, you know, if, you don't have, if you haven't been to Israel, you read your Bible, it's like you're reading it, in black and white, and it's sometimes red, amen? But when you go to Israel and you come back, you read it in 3D now, man. Because you don't just see words anymore. You're visioning places that you've been to already. Absolutely, it's absolutely unbelievable. Mary or Miriam gave birth to our Lord. He was wrapped in swaddling clothes, and he was laid. Not born in the manger. He was born in the manger. It doesn't say that in the Bible. It said he was laid in a manger. Again, they were bandaged like strips of cloth wrapped around the Jewish infant to ensure the bones and the limbs would grow straight. And that's how it was in the first century. And failing to do that was a form of child abuse. Did you know that? If you 2,000 years ago, if you failed to rub your child with salt, if you failed to wash the child, if you failed to wrap swaddling clothes, it was considered a form of child abuse. How do you know that, August? Well, I have a King James Bible right here. Amen? Amen. Just for the sake of time, just, just appease me for a moment. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter number 16. I want to show you something. Ezekiel chapter number 16, verses 1 through 4. Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel is right before the book of Daniel. Ezekiel chapter 16. You might want to... Keep this in reference just in case you bring it up to someone. Well, how do you know it was a form of child abuse 2,000 years ago? Well, let's go to the Bible. Amen? Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. And I'm just going to go ahead and read. Ezekiel 16, 1 through 4. Hold your place in Luke. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, Ben Adam in Hebrew, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. And say, thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem, thy birth... And the nativity is of the land of Canaan, or today Israel. Thy father was an Amorite, and thy mother an Hittite. And as for thy nativity, in the day thou wast born, thy navel was not cut. 
neither was thou washed in water to supple thee. Thou was not salted. You see what you see what it says here? Thou was not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. Fail to do so was child of birth. Uh, well, child, not child, but child abuse. And God uses this as an analogy to show Jerusalem's abominations at that time. God said, your abominations is just as bad as child abuse. You see the analogy here in Ezekiel chapter 16, 1 through 4? Let's go back to Luke chapter number 2. At Jesus' birth, he is wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. And the Jewish prophet Micah then predicted the place of his birth. Micah chapter 5 and verse number 2. There's the prophecy. Now we know in Micah 4, 8, he's telling the priestly shepherds back then about the first coming of the Messiah. But then when we get to Micah chapter 5, verse 2, the place where he would be born. Look at this. But thou Bethlehem, Ephrata. That's an interesting word. Ephrata, Ephrata. Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me. That is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth has been from old, from everlasting. So now Micah is telling us where the Messiah would be born. Not in Migdal Adar, the tower of the flock, but just adjacent to Migdal Adar, the town of Bethlehem. Now what's interesting is that when I was in the Galilee, going to our hotel, I saw a sign in the north that said Bethlehem. I'm like, wait a minute. Bethlehem is in the south, in Judea. We're in the north, in the Galilee. What up with that? There's a Bethlehem in the north, but there's also a Bethlehem in the south. So if Michael would have said this, but thou Bethlehem and leave out Ephrata, the Jewish mind would have been like, uh, Micah, which Bethlehem are you talking about? The Bethlehem in the north or the Bethlehem in the south? So now Micah has to be specific here and say, but thou Bethlehem, Ephrata. Oh, now we know what Bethlehem you're talking about. The Bethlehem in the south. The Bethlehem of Judea. That is where the Messiah would be born. And you want to know what's interesting about that word, Bethlehem? Bethlehem. Can someone read that? Okay. You always read Hebrew from right to left. Bethlehem comes from two Hebrew words. First one, Beit Yod Taf. Beit, B-E-T, house. Second Hebrew word, Lamed, Kaf, Mem, Lechem, bread. Jesus was born where? The house of bread. That's what Bethlehem means in Hebrew. Beit Lechem, the house of bread bread. No wonder in John 6, 35, what did Jesus say of himself? I am the bread of life. Because the bread of life is born in Beit Lechem. He's born in the house of bread. Yet in John 6, 12 times, it mentions bread. How many loaves of bread were in the tabernacle? The table of show bread? 12 Loaves of bread, representing the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Man, it's a Jewish story, amen? So he was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Now, the controversy here is, well, I believe Jesus was born on December 25th, 4 B.C. The Bible doesn't give us any indication of that. That's, that's just... Tradition, there's no indication he was born on December 25th of 4 B.C. As a matter of fact, in Luke chapter 2, verse 8, look what it says right here. And there were in the same country shepherds, those were the priestly shepherds of Migdal Adar, abiding in the field, and what are they doing? Keeping watch over what? The flock, the tower of the flock. By night, these are the 
priestly shepherds here to keep a watch over the flock by night. And Luke records that these shepherds were abiding in the field, Migdaleda, near Bethlehem. Here's the problem with the December 25th date. Tra traditionally, shepherds in Israel guard their flocks around the clock during the spring, during the lambing times. They can't do it in the winter. You know why? Ooh. It's too cold out there to be watching flocks in the field. They'd freeze to death out there during the winter months, so it's too cold to watch the flocks. And during the winter, instead of having the animals out in the fields, they would have the animals penned in corals on watch because it would be too cold to do it in the winter time. So what is that telling you? Even rabbis who don't even believe Jesus is the Messiah would say it would be impossible for him to be born in the winter because the shepherds would not be out in the fields during the winter time. So you know what they're saying? He was most likely born in the spring. Probably at around the time of Passover, since he is the Passover lamb, amen, who taketh away. You see, it all connects, ladies and gentlemen. We, get, we need to get rid of tradition, man. We need to get, and just stick with what the scriptures say. These shepherds were abiding in the fields. The, the priestly shepherds, where? Migdal Adar, near Bethlehem. That's why Micah chapter 4, verse 8, tells us that the first coming of the Messiah, the first dominion, would come to that area. Look in verse number 9 when we Luke chapter 2, verse 9. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, Bethlehem, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe, there it is again, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, a feeding trough. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. They weren't already in Bethlehem. They were still at the tower of the flock. They were still in Migdaladar. So when the angel appears to these shepherds, most likely in the springtime, what do they say? Let us go to Bethlehem, which wasn't that far, by the way, from the tower of the flock, and see this site, verse 16, and they came with haste and found Miriam. That's, she would have been known that 2,000 years ago, not Mary, Miriam. It's all right, we call her Mary today, but Miriam and Joseph, Joseph, <laughs> not that Joseph. He's like, hey, you talking to me? What you talking about, Willis? <laughs> and the babe lying in the manger. Wow, what a Jewish story this is. The prophecy. I'm going to tie it all together here and close it. The prophecy of the Messiah's first coming or first dominion was at the tower of the flock. Micah chapter 4 verse 8. Then Micah shows where the Messiah would be born. Not to Bethlehem up north in the Galilee, but to Bethlehem Ephrata mm -hmm. in the south of Judea where the Messiah would be born. I told you already at his first coming, he is a lamb led to the slaughter. But that's not going to be the case, folks, at his second coming, amen? At his second coming, he is coming back. Let's just skip through there. He is coming back. There's Migdal. That's the area of Bethlehem right there. And uh, that's probably what that tower would have looked like right there, a three-story tower, if you will, where the priestly shepherds would have looked down on them. But he's coming back. <laughs> Woo! That's enough to make you put a shout in your hip, Amen. He's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's going to one day come back as the king of kings and lord of lords. He's coming back as a warrior. And you know what he's going to do when he comes back at a second coming? At the end of the tribulation period, he's coming back to judge and to make war. But he's the Sar Shalom, isn't he? The prince of peace. Yeah, he's the prince of peace. And he can bring peace to your life. 
But for those who gather against him, to try to over, he's coming back as a warrior to make war. A sword coming out of his mouth to destroy his enemies. So Christmas reminds us of not only his first coming to this earth, but Christmas also reminds us that he's coming back. Just as he was a light to the world 2,000 years ago, we ought to be a light to the world today. Christmas involves lights, right? So does Hanukkah. Hanukkah involves lighting candles, eight candles for that matter. So what am I telling you? The stage is set. The actors are getting into position. Curtain is about to go up on the end time drama. The next main event on God's calendar of activities is the rapture of the church. I tell you, when I go to churches all over the country, I like to toot my own horn. <laughs> but for a good cause, though, amen? Because at the rapture, the trumpet's going to sound, and it's going to be so loud, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, pow, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Come up hither. And in the moment, in the twinkling, faster than you can blink the human eye, we're out. We're out of here. We're gone. Amen. And he's going to take us to the Father's house, John 14, 1 through 3. And when we're up there, we are going to be there for just seven years. <laughs> I was like, I had one guy, forever. I'm like, no, sir, just seven years. He's like, what? He, oh, he was like, what? Yeah, just, just a brief seven years, man. While the earth below goes through a seven-year period of, oh, tribulation. But we'll be in heaven for seven years. And after seven years, we get on white horses. We're going to giddy up, following the Messiah, the King of Kings, back to planet Earth where he will establish his kingdom for a thousand years. So if you've never been to Israel in this lifetime, I promise you, you'll be there in the next. Amen. Because for a thousand years, you're all going to be Israelis. Amen. Living in Jerusalem for one thousand years. Woo! Doesn't get any better than that, amen? But if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, you need to get saved today. Let's pray. Lord in heaven.